it absorb. You want to reduce the material and still achieve high efficiency in your solar cells. So, to understand uh, you know how uh, silicon photovoltaics work, there are three main components that are needed. One is that uh, it needs to absorb all the light, so it needs to absorb all the photons which are above the band gap. Then the other thing which is needed is a good uh, lifetime or uh, low recombination uh, times associated with these carriers. So these carriers are around. I mean, basically when they are generated, they are if they are immediately they recombine immediately, then it won't be a good solar cell. So you want to maximize your career lifetime. The other third important thing is you want to uh, have good transport properties for these uh, electron and hole pairs. So once they are generated they should be fast enough or you should be able to collect them at the contacts uh, quickly before they recombine. So all these three things play a role in determining the overall efficiency of the cell. <coughs> so the first thing is uh, absorption and uh, the parameter which is used to describe that is uh, the absorption length or the absorption coefficient and these two things are uh, inverse of each other. So if you have a high absorption coefficient, means you have a low absorption length. And uh, the intensity of the light, it, uh, falls, uh, uh, it falls exponentially as, uh, you know, as a function of your absorption coefficient of your absorption length. So within one absorption length, you typically absorb 63% of the total power or the total intensity of, uh, of the incoming light. And this is heavily dependent upon what kind of uh, material you are using, the absorption coefficient. So if you are using a direct band gap material, your absorption length, it is of the order of one micron. So if you are using a direct band gap material, you will absorb 63% of the light in one micron of the material. So you need much less of it. So you can make a high efficiency cell with a very uh, less uh, volume of the material. If you're using an indirect band gap material, these things are vary, but it's typically between 10 to 100 microns. So you need a large length of the material. So your material cost, which is uh, uh, going to be associated with your cell, invariantly has to be uh, high. So this is the absorption coefficient for silicon. And silicon, as uh, you might know, is not the best material for absorbing light. So if you look at the absorption coefficient uh, over here, uh, this is uh, separated over different wavelengths. So these are my blue photons. So they in fact have a very high absorption coefficient. And if I look at the absorption length over here, this is plotted in micron. So they are, you know, they are getting absorbed in 10 to power minus 3, 10 to power minus 2 uh, microns, you know, within the first uh, few hundred uh, nanometers of my device. If I look at my uh, green photons, which are somewhere intermediate uh, in the energy, Again, they have an absorption coefficient uh, or this absorption length of a few, uh, you know, few tens or a few uh, hundreds of a micron. So if I have a, if I have a, a hundred micron cell, I'll absorb most of my uh, green photons as well. But uh, if I look at these red photons, which are somewhere over here, so uh, somewhere close to the band gap of my cell, so you see that these have an absorption length which is 10 to the power 6 uh, micron, or that would be a meter, right? So you will have to make a, a, a silicon cell which is a meter, a meter deep to absorb if you want to absorb uh, these photons which are very close to the band gap. So you see that that of course wouldn't be a very uh, you know a very efficient cell. If you have first of all you have this bigger cell. And even if you are able to absorb these uh, red photons, you will lose all the other photons which were generated uh, you know, in between because they won't be able to make it to the contact. They will recombine by the time they reach or they travel through this uh, huge uh, silicon cell. So you immediately see the problem with uh, absorbing light in uh, silicon because it's a poor absorber of light. And especially for these uh, red photons which are close to the band gap. Uh, the absorption length for those uh, is huge. So we need to do something about it. And we'll learn what to do something about it uh, in today's lecture. <coughs> so first of all, let me, let me, you know, let me uh, give you some more uh, physics to understand how, how this light absorption works. So you have this uh, conduction band which is full of uh, electrons. And then you have, uh, you have this valence band which is full of electrons.
and then you have this conduction band which is empty of electrons and whenever you have an uh, incoming photon it takes up that uh, uh, electron present in the valence band and uh, pushes it up to the conduction band the two two important things which uh, needs to be preserved in this process is the energy and the other thing which needs to be conserved in this absorption process is the momentum and this momentum conservation is what distinguishes light absorption in a direct versus an indirect uh, band gap material. And uh, I can understand that by looking at uh, the picture of these uh, band diagrams over here. So in a direct band gap material, what happens is that my valence band is uh, exactly in line with my conduction band, or the minimum of this valence band, it occurs at the same point in the K space. So if you guys don't know K-space, an easy way to think about that is think of this as crystal momentum. So these two energy levels, they occur at the same momentum level in a direct band gap material. So whenever I have an incoming photon, this photon uh, has a lot of energy, but it has no momentum. So uh, it can still transition, it can cause the transition of this electron from the, uh, from the valence band into the conduction band because they are aligned in the same momentum space. Versus an indirect band gap material, you have these uh, electrons uh, which are located in the valence band. They are located at this point in the K space where they have uh, essentially they are located at the minima or K equal to zero. And if I look at the if I look at the conduction band or this minimum of this band, this occurs at this point in the K space, or it has a different momentum associated with it. So this incoming photon, it does not have sufficient motor. It has good amount of energy. But photon has a, you know, photon does not have too much momentum, so it cannot cause an electron to go from here all the way to here. So it needs the assistance of uh, what is called as a phonon or a lattice vibration. So it needs to absorb that amount of momentum from the lattice for uh, this. Uh, uh, electron to go from the valence band into the conduction band. So this is a two particle process essentially it involves this uh, photon and this uh, electron. While this is a three particle process it involves the uh, it involves the photon, it involves this electron and it involves this uh, phonon. So that's why the the rate of uh, generation happens to be much lower for an indirect uh, band gap material and that's why you see these absorption uh, coefficient or these uh, length of absorption which are much higher uh, for, uh, for these indirect band gap materials. <coughs> so over here I'm comparing these uh, two materials, gallium uh, arsenide which uh, is a direct band gap material and uh, silicon which is a indirect uh, band gap material. So I see that silicon has a band gap of 1.1 uh, so the absorption coefficient uh, starts uh, rising uh, from there while gallium arsenide it has a band gap of approximately 1.4 so this absorption coefficient starts uh, uh, from uh, from that energy level but if I look at any of these uh, points such as you know for example if I if I take the case of uh, a photon which has an energy of let's say 1.6 or 1.7 uh, electron volts. So I immediately see that my gallium arsenide it has more than an order of magnitude higher absorption coefficient as compared to silicon. So this is more than 10x higher, meaning that photon will get absorbed in 10x less amount of length as compared to what is the length of material needed uh, in silicon. And you should also consider into fact that uh, this photon which is at uh, 1.6 eV, it is 0.5 electron volt away from the band gap of silicon. So it's much higher than the band gap of silicon, but still it has you know, much lower absorption uh, coefficient or a much higher absorption length as compared to what you get in a direct band gap material. So this explains why you need, uh, you know, much, uh, you need uh, uh, a thicker cell if you are uh, if you are making solar cells uh, with uh, silicon. So typically the uh, solar cells people have tried to reduce the amount of material. So they have tried to reduce the silicon thickness you know to between 100 to 200 uh, micron. 
But if you go beyond, if you go below that, first of all, you don't get good absorption for these uh, red photons. The other thing is, it's uh, it complicates your manufacturing flow because these thin wafers they are easy, they are much harder to handle in a fab as well. <coughs> so these are some of the questions you should ask the next speaker that how they handle these thin materials and thin films of uh, uh, thin uh, uh, very thin films of uh, silicon. So it's clear that we need to do something about uh, you know improving this absorption. So we need to enhance this uh, absorption. And I need to do something about you know trapping these uh, uh, trapping light in these uh, solar cells as well. So, <clears throat> so let me first start by looking at uh, what is the optical requirement for a good solar cell. So this is my mission statement. So I want to design a cell such that uh, it absorbs all the light which is above the band gap. But some people confuse it and they say, you know, this is the same thing as having an anti-reflection coating. So these two are very different things. Light trapping and anti-reflection coating are, are two different things. And let me illustrate that by asking this uh, question. So if I have a silicon uh, solar cell and uh, I put an anti-reflection uh, coating, so I'll put an anti-reflection coating on this side maybe and also put an anti-reflection coating on this side. So does that make a, does that make it a good uh, solar cell, or how many things like if I just put it on one side, would that be better? <clears throat> Which is a better design? Should I put this anti-reflective coating on both sides, or should I put it just on one side? How many people think this this is a better design? Seems more symmetric. Okay, how many people think this is a better design, which has only hand reflective coating on one side? Okay, Yi Sheng, why do you think this is a better? Okay, so Yi Sheng is saying that uh, if I if I have a, say a yellow photon coming from here, it would get in and leave out, right? And does this presence of the anti-reflection coating help in that photon getting out? No. Yeah, then why? Uh, sorry, not Ben. Sam, right? Yeah. Okay. Why do you think that it helps? Or it doesn't help the solar cell. It helps, but it makes it less likely to reflect. So you're saying this present of the silicon nitride at the back, it helps light in escaping out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, it does, right? So why? I mean, you're thinking right, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but a lot of people don't realize is that whatever helps you to trap light, or whatever helps you to uh, uh, essentially reduce your index when your light is coming in, also helps in getting the light out. So, for example. Let me consider the case of uh, obliquely incident photon. So this photon is coming in at uh, this angle. Let me consider the case when there was uh, no anti-reflection coating present. So uh, if I had this over here and I had this photon incident over here. So this anti presence of this uh, anti-reflection coating, it will reduce the effective index that I see over here. So typically the silicon has a refractive index of 3.6, while this uh, silicon nitride has somewhere in between around 1.9. So it will, according to that uh, Snell's law, this uh, anti-reflective coating will help me get this photon into my cell, right? But what if it, when it reaches back over here? Now it will, if, if this thing was not present over here, right, and this photon was incident, 
at uh, let's say at an angle of uh, 50 degrees right and I had a refractive index of 3.6 here and one over here so this photon would have stayed this photon would have got reflected uh, in here but what would happen in this case it can go out right so because this uh, presence of this intermediate refractive index material it not only just helps in getting photon in but it also helps in uh, getting photons out so it's good to uh, that's why whenever you design uh, most of these uh, system they design uh, asymmetric uh, and reflective coating so what they do is they'll uh, you start with a silicon uh, material and you usually only put the anti-reflective coating on uh, one side of your, your silicon. The other side you put uh, um, a good uh, reflector which will reflect this uh, light back. So you usually only put the anti-reflective coating uh, on one side and you hope that uh, this anti-reflective coating uh, will help getting the light in and then this reflector at the back will reflect it back. And by the time it reaches the top, you hope that a lot of these photons are already absorbed by that time. But if this material was a really, really shabby absorber of the light, then this anti-reflective coating will in fact help those photons get out rather than them staying in. So this breaking this asymmetry is a very important part of how these uh, light trapping systems are designed. Because usually your optics is, is reciprocal. If something is a good, if something helps in enhancing absorption, it also helps in uh, getting these uh, light out from the system. So you'll be surprised that the same kind of techniques that are used to trap light in a solar cell, the same type techniques are used in the LED to get light out of the LED. So it's, both are very reciprocal system in some sense.